So Colette, you've, um, you've been an ally of the LGBT community for, for years, uh, but it didn't maybe come about through sort of a conventional uh, way that, uh, in terms of your own consciousness about these issues. Um, but like lots of people, it's very personal, having to do with your family, and so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your personal experience about when you were maybe confronted with having to think about this on a very personal level. Well, I'd say it was an ally uh, from the time I became aware of people being gay. Um, I had many gay and lesbian friends, some hard times living in the Bay Area during the AIDS epidemic. I lost three friends to AIDS. Um, I watched a good friend of mine who was <clears throat> a lesbian be ejected from the church and I never saw her again. So I was aware of the loss and at that time because of the time and place it felt to me like the danger of being gay in America. But it really became personal for me when my son came out in 2005. At that point, I had lived in Michigan for 15 years. Moving from the Bay Area to Michigan was a kind of culture shock that I can't really describe. I don't think I even knew that places like this existed because I came from such an open place. And so to survive in this area, I pretty much went underground with my personal beliefs, which meant being silent as an ally. So when my son came out, it was a pivotal moment in my personal journey. I had to listen to my own true north and follow that but the context of our lives was so really hostile toward having a son come out. Um, I just remember sitting on the bathroom floor with the door closed, which I think is the secret place that moms hide when they want to get some time and think about things. And I remember thinking, this is a management issue that over the 15 years I've been in Michigan, I had seen many people come out, but it was always surrounded with drama and trauma, and it always ended up with them being ejected from their families. And it was determined that that wasn't going to happen for my own son, but unsure as to how to create a space for him. So I just did it boldly. And it I remember my own voice being really loud and clear about the right thing. But sometimes it was so oppressive to be bombarded with other voices saying that I was a bad mother or that I'd turned my children over to Satan uh, or many of the other things that I heard. It just really was difficult. Um, I went and did what any good mom would do. I went to the bookstore and I bought all the books on being gay. And one of them that I read was called Coming Out, An Act of Love. And it was scenarios of people coming out, every different constellation of a relationship, father to son, son to father, to grandma, to best friend. And so many of those stories were filled with pain and loss. And I was determined that I was going to just do something different for my own son. But there were some good stories in there, and um, my son Ari picked up the book and read it one day, and he's a super fast reader, so he went through it one day, came down that afternoon, and he said, thanks for lending me the book, Mom. And he put it down on the counter, upside down and backwards, so that you couldn't see the title. And his sister had a friend over, and I assumed that was why he did it. And it was like microseconds of counting down. I knew that was a moment. And I went over and I flipped the book over. I said, Ari, 
I appreciate your sensitivity. I'm noticing how you set this book down, but I want you to know that is not how we're going to live. Um, and during that time, to encourage him, I looked for cards to get him, and I got him a card that said, the best way out is through. And in it, I told him, your coming out is a crisis for our family, but the crisis is not that you're gay. The crisis is that we have to ask ourselves, why have our lives not been more supportive of the gay community? And that is really painful. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe how your son's coming out and both the difficulties of that um, for your family in terms of some of the negative response from the community. Uh, how did that whole experience change you personally? And what, <clears throat> what was difficult about it, but also what was maybe liberating for you as a mother uh, to sort of stand by her son during that period? Hmm. Well, for me, it was a time when I did a lot of research, found out sort of the what the anti-gay industry was all about that was so entrenched in West Michigan. Where was the money coming from? Um, just this institutionalized hatred that we seem to be surrounded by. And when I saw that structure of oppression that was set up against the queer community, then I began to see how it was set up against other communities as well. And with every month, it became clearer and clearer. And still, to this day, it's an evolution where I'm able to just take off the veils of that that privilege allows me to have so I don't see things as starkly as they are. The process was liberating for me in that I feel like I am my true self and that wasn't easy for me to get to in this space. Um, and I have received many, many letters from uh, members of the queer community who have thanked me for being out, for um, being proud of my son and celebrating him, and that's been really re rewarding. Now you, um, you, a few years later then, um, decided to kind of make uh, being an ally, an advocate for LGBTQ issues, even sort of part of your work, uh, and went to work for the, for the Triangle Foundation, uh, which at that time had a branch in the office in West Michigan. I wonder if you just talk a little bit about how you came about, you know, coming by that kind of work and what that entailed, and, you know, again, what significance that had in, in, in terms of your, your own uh, growth about this issue. Well, I'm going to frame it a little bit differently. Um, I wouldn't say that I made it my work. I would say that I became more and more passionate about LGBT issues and began writing letters to the editor and speaking truth to power wherever I could. And one of those times I went to Lansing for Safe School Lobby Day and there I met Sean Kosofsky who was the policy director for Triangle Foundation and we just hit it off and I had an incredible life-changing experience that day where I stood with three parents speaking to our state senator and these three parents told the story about stories about how their children had committed suicide as a result of being bullied and then I told Ari's story and the senator just crossed his arms and looked over the tops of the heads of the parents and said no, I just don't think it's a problem. And I, I thought, professional parents say something, but they were re-traumatized and they didn't say anything. And I realized it was me. And I think I just barked at the senator. Senator, three parents have buried their children. 
what more proof do you need? And we went back to gather together at Safe Schools Lobby Day and I told that story. It was a moment for me in seeing, I had thought our legislators would be more compassionate. I don't know why I thought that, but I did. And uh, I created some relationships with people who were there that day. I had my worldview changed and I developed this great relationship with Sean. So then I went back and continued to do what I did, which included being Safe Schools coordinator for PFLAG, Parents, Friends, and Family of Lesbian and Gays. And um, one time I was just overwhelmed. I'd written this letter to the editor um, to confront some misinformation about reparative therapy, and I just got bombarded with negativity from other people, and it was very personal. Sentences like, we know why Colette Beagley likes the gays. What is that? So anyway, I called Sean up and I said, I, I need to talk to you. I'm going to drive over to Detroit to see you. And he said, sure. So I drove over, had lunch with him, and went blah, 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 blah. By that time, we had received ex many, many, many letters from the family talking about how we were victimizing our son by allowing him to do this. Um, my then husband had lost his ministerial license in the Wesleyan Church because of his support for our son. Our, it, it's, it was a small town, Spring Lake. Word spread like wildfire. And um, my ex-husband and I were both marriage and family therapists. Our clinical practices dropped 70%. So we were really feeling the impact. And I went over and saw Sean and just talked about it because even though I knew what the right thing to do was, I, it, it's slippery, not in terms of the truth, but in terms of being able to be strong enough to keep going. And he gave me this great pep talk and um, more than that, just we built a wonderful relationship. And then I went back and kept doing my work. But what I didn't know is he went back to Triangle and with the staff wrote a grant to Arcus Foundation asking to open a West Michigan field office. When they received that grant, they called me and they didn't interview anybody. They just asked me to staff that office. So that was how that happened. And how long did you work with the Triangle Foundation? And you know, what kind of things uh, did you do while you had a uh, we're sort of staffing the office here in Grand Rapids? Well, we created events to bring the community together. We spoke out about homophobia in the community. There were several large things that happened during that time, including um, going up against Spectrum Hospital for their treatment of a lesbian couple. Also during that time, we lost a 16-year-old transgender youth, and um, that was beyond description. It was mostly just connecting and being a resource to the LGBT community and mainstreaming the issues and bringing visibility to the community were the two directives. You mentioned earlier that you became aware of, more aware of, and had done a lot of research looking at sort of the, sort of the institutions and entities and individuals who are kind of not at all shy about being anti-gay, anti-LGBT. Uh, could you say a little bit more about how what they do is manifested, particularly in West Michigan? Obviously, they, they've done stuff out of state and around the state, but in West Michigan in particular, how do you think that that kind of political power that they have uh, uh, affects people on the ground here? That's a big question. I, I believe... I've looked at their 990 PFs. I see historically what kinds of huge money they've given to the anti-gay industry. And by that, I mean Family Research Council, the American Family Association, um, Thomas More Law Center, Focus on the Family, the list goes on, including funding some huge conservative think tanks. And uh, they are no friends to the gay community. I think that those big names in West Michigan that fund the anti-gay industry are enormously powerful here because of their money. And so 
that gives their voice extra volume. And like, I mean a hundred times extra volume. And people listen to and respect them without thinking critically about the meaning of those decisions on individual lives. So when things like Love One Out or Promise Keepers come to town, they're greeted with enthusiasm and large crowds. But what people don't know, and this is easy to um, I lost my word. It's easy to, um, God, sorry guys. It's all right. It's easy to uh, verify. Let me just try again. What they don't know and what's easy to verify through the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs is that violence against the gay community skyrockets when those Christian programs come to town. And so that money, that power, those values that they are undergirding with that money and power directly filtered down into the lived experience of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. You eventually then uh, went to work in Grand Valley uh, with the LGBT Resource Center there. Um, so speak a little bit about how that came to be and then your time as sort of a, in kind of an assistant director position and then eventually as the, as the director. I was on the advisory committee that helped develop the LGBT Resource Center at Grand Valley. Five years ago, Grand Valley had a campus climate survey as a result of some uh, racial graffiti on campus and also a gay couple walking across campus holding hands was spit on. As a result of that survey, there were several recommendations made that affected the LGBT community at Grand Valley directly. One was the development of an LGBT resource center. The other was the development of an LGBT faculty and staff association. Another was the development of bias incident protocol and a team against bias. And another recommendation was the establishment of a division of inclusion and equity that would be staffed at the vice presidential level. And all of those recommendations were implemented by Grand Valley. Would you say that in terms of how Grand Valley ranks with other campuses in the state or even other campuses in the country, I mean, where are they at in terms of their at a policy level around LGBTQ issues? Sure. Well, we have to put it in the context of this geography, and I think what does that easily is the fact that the very first LGBT Resource Center was on the campus of the University of Michigan. That was four decades prior to Grand Valley opening our LGBT Resource Center, four decades. So 40 years later we did it, but it was still trailblazing for Grand Valley in this area. As far as how we compare to other campuses around the country, we, only 7% of campuses have LGBT resource centers to, um, to start out with, but we are very visible. We have, we're part of three centers, one vision with the Office of Multicultural Affairs and the Women's Center. Um, we're fully integrated into the life of the campus. Our non-discrimination policy includes sexual orientation and gender identity or expression. We have just recently formed a Gender Identity and Expression Committee, and um, we serve at the pleasure of the Vice President, to address institutional policy to make sure that it's consistent with our non-discrimination policy and that the needs of um, the transgender community on campus are addressed in our health care, in our HR policies, in our, uh, the way we handle athletic policies. So that's a big task that's underway right now at Grand Valley. But I'm very, very proud to work at Grand Valley, and I feel as though they have a huge voice for that initial imperative of creating more visibility for the community and mainstreaming the issues. Maybe shifting away a little bit from sort of the policy side of it, and you uh, 
your office provides resources and programming and other mechanisms of support for students uh, who are who are you know, who are identifying as LGBTQ or you know gender variant or, or you know just exploring you know just trying to um, so just on kind of a relational level what you know how important and what kind of what kind of outcomes have you seen because students have that kind of resource those resources available to them at Grand Valley? It's imperative to have an LGBT resource center on college campuses and it's part of best practices in student services even though it's not implemented widely at this point. Queer students who come to campus not only have that highly documented college journey experience of growth, but they also have this other journey of their identity development and those are going on at the same time. So they really do need a lot of support and they need to know that the university recognizes this journey and that there's a place for them. It's been quite a gift in my life to work with the students. They are super smart and are always teaching me every day. Um, it's rewarding to create a place for them for example, I received an email late last night from a student who wants to come out. He's a junior, but is really afraid to do so and doesn't even want to walk into the LGBT Resource Center, wants me to meet him somewhere else on campus. And so to Grand Valley is addressing that level of pain in students. They're saying, we recognize it. In fact, the president came out with a letter to all 25,000 campus community members this last fall acknowledging the rash of LGBT youth suicides and offering his support to the community and naming resources including our candlelight vigil. So we're very verbal about our support for the community and it receives national recognition actually. So I feel really proud. The students are amazing. They are out in the community working. They're changing things at Grand Valley. Um, they've opened, there, were t there was one student organization, queer student organization when I came there. Now there are three. There's a gender neutral housing coalition which um, is a powerhouse in creating change on our campus. And it, they're, they're amazing and they're the best part of the work. Obviously, Grand Valley has had a, <coughs> not only because it's located, well, it's also located not only out, just outside of Grand Rapids, it's also located in Grand Rapids now. Uh, what kind of relationship does the LGBT Resource Center have with LGBT organizations or you know, just folks in the LGBT community in Grand Rapids? What, what's, what does that look like? Um, and how has that evolved maybe over the years as, as you've seen it? Mm -hmm. Well, when we first opened up, we hosted um, a community conversation with LGBT organizations and invited them up for a dinner and just introduced them to each other and just created that space. Uh, we've worked with LGBT organizations in many different ways as needs have come up, and we always look for ways to partner. Um, we are, let's see... Next month, this month actually, we're working with West Michigan Pride to do the Pride Movie Night. And we have a big ad on the inside cover of the Pride Guide, and we'll also have a booth at Pride. So whenever an opportunity presents itself, we try to partner up with other organizations. You know, I've been, when I've been talking with other folks, uh, we've been interviewing lots of people, and one of the questions that we've been asking folks is uh, just sort of historically looking at maybe some internal tensions within the LGBT community between folks who would rather assimilate into kind of American society as a whole and other folks who see their own identity as part of a larger maybe liberation struggle at some, some level. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that? tension existing within like the students you work with or with your organizations in West Michigan and, and if so uh, I mean how 
how important is it to kind of not only recognize it, but to kind of make that a part of the ongoing conversation we have about, you know, uh, what we're really, what the goal, what our goals are with, you know, with this, these issues. I don't see that kind of tension in the students. And I look at that as a very generational experience. Um, my students are all about busting binaries and identifying as radically queer and challenging the norms. They have a different experience growing up and coming out than someone who's 50, 60, 70 did. And those in the younger age group in between the 40s, even 50s, they dealt with the AIDS epidemic. So each experience of being gay is so different. I often see my students not wanting to get involved in learning much about LGBT history. And I've often wondered if that isn't a result of the AIDS epidemic, that looking back is so horrifying. But those older generations don't have the option of not knowing what happened, whether it's the epidemic or um, other kinds of violence that the community has experienced. So it's great when they can get together and um, understand that the community is made up of many different people with many, many different experiences. This, the LGBT community, it isn't just LGBT. Each one of those has such diversity within it. It's, it's just a beautiful community made up of many communities. And um, so things like Pride are a great time for the students to be exposed to some of those different subcultures within the community. And obviously, although much of the impetus for us wanting to kind of do this project was to not only try to document it, but maybe uh, unearth maybe some of this history that, uh, that many of us have been completely unaware of at least I'm maybe only marginally aware of. Um, how, how important do you think it is for people, future generations, to have a sense of, uh, of this history, particularly at a local level, uh, mm. to sort of see like where we've come you know, over a period of time as a, as a community? Mm. There's a saying in Zen, we stand on the shoulders of our teachers, not on their heads. And I think that if we don't look back and appreciate those who've come before to do the work, that we don't have a clear sense of what the work is. Um, we have to understand the context and the history, I think, to do effective work. So there's immense value in this project, and I'm so excited about the vast numbers of people who are interested in and participating in it. And assuming that 10, 20, 30 years from now, people will be looking at these interviews and uh, looking at the archive for the material. Um, obviously, one hope is that we'll be more evolved, that there'll be more justice in the next generation as it specifically relates to this kind, these kinds of issues. But uh, we know from history that it's, just, it's, an ongoing, it's going to be an ongoing struggle. So as someone who's been an ally for a long time, uh, if you had words uh, to share with people who could be potential allies 20, 30 years down the road, uh, what might you say to them about what's the importance of being an ally um, of people in the LGBT community? I had someone say to me, why are you always screaming? And I said, why aren't you? I think that when we have privilege, which allies have privilege, that it's not enough to stand beside those people who do not have that particular privilege, but we need to be out in front. Out in front, taking the hits, out in front, clearing the way, because we can because we have a different voice. 
And it's our moral obligation to do so. And it also, I believe, it's, it's a, almost a spiritual practice for me, it undergirds my own humanity. I didn't have any other questions, but if there's something you would like to say that hasn't been addressed with the career, it was. Okay. And thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I have a question. Oh! <laughs> Wait. You know, since we're doing, you know, done these interviews from the, we were talking about history, and we interviewed these people who were part of Grand Valley at TJC. You know, do you have any sort of sense? Because even though it was 40 decades <laughs> that finally Grand Valley, but there was something that happened then. Did that have any effect, you think, on the current culture? I'm just kind of curious. Of, and I, would you form that as a question or something, Jeff? I mean, or is that something you could answer, Claude? Or would you like to answer it? Well, maybe if we could insert it back into the power structure part of the interview. Yeah, maybe to, so. To say something about, like, um, that... The conservative money that runs Grand Rapids and all those names that we see on all the buildings have had a very oppressive impact on the LGBT community. But it wasn't always that way. And at Grand Valley, certainly we've had a history of having some very radical feminist voices. But when we look at the impact of those families and that money, we can't just say that they've built these buildings and they've done all these wonderful things. We also need to include that they've silenced many voices and they have done irreparable damage to many lives. And so while we're coming back in terms of having a greater voice in this area, it doesn't negate all the damage that was done all the lives that were hurt as a result of that.